Welcome everybody. I am so glad to see you all on this call and I'm just really glad that um, you chose today to be with us. Um, we've chosen these webinars. We're hoping that these are educational and informative information. And so today we, are, uh, we have the privilege of having Dr. Valerie Smith back. She was our very first presenter and did such an awesome job. But it's my honor to introduce her today. She is a pediatrician in Tyler, Texas. She serves on the TMA COVID-19 Task Force. She is on the TMA COVID Return to School Work Group as chair. And she's also on the TMA Subcommittee on behalf of health chair. I'm sorry, on behavioral health chair. And she's um, a, just a very busy lady, as you can see. She's also actively involved in Texas Pediatric Society. And I know today they started their annual meeting. So I'm really thankful she could take her time out and to give us this presentation. So today the topic's gonna be COVID-19. What do we know and where are we going? So Thanks, Martha. Let me share my screen with you guys and then start the slideshow, all the fun. I wish I could figure out how to have Zoom going with the slideshow already preloaded, but like in, in um, slideshow view, right? But I have not figured that one out yet because every time I touch something on Zoom, it exits, right? PowerPoint. Um, we should all be pros by the end of this year, right? In this particular, uh, um, at least in, in Zoom technology, I would, I would think. Um, so I thank you guys so much for having me um, back. Um, I hope that um, today has some information and I hope we really have a, a chance to have some discussion about um, any questions or concerns you all have um, kind of related to COVID-19 and, and really where we're going and, and how we make plans and uh, make choices about what to do and, and maybe not to do um, given where we are with the pandemic. Um, so Martha did a really lovely job of of all these credentials <laughs> that I put on here. Um, so I won't, I won't list them again. Just know that uh, behavioral health uh, and school health are particular passions of mine and then food insecurity and um, uh, foster care for children in, or ca medical care for children and foster care um, are kind of the roles that I, that I sit in. Um, and somehow I didn't turn my phone off, my bad y'all. Okay, now we're on silent mode, apologies. Um, I did wanna just kind of highlight what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so I wanted to give just an overview of where we are with the COVID-19 pandemic, at least um, kind of statewide. Um, what we do know is that it varies greatly from community to community, what's happening right now, um, but just kind of generally where we are, um, what's been going on with school reopening, what the TMA work group has been doing and also kind of what we're seeing around the state as schools open. Um, there's been a lot of discussion recently over different testing options and what one test means versus another. So I wanted to kind of walk through that so that if you are exposed or have symptoms and you find yourself getting a test, you know what that means, um, right? Uh, obviously, you guys have uh, family members who are physicians who can help walk you through some of that process as well. But um, I find that sometimes the terms are either used interchangeably in the media or are not used correctly as, uh, as people are talking about different options for testing. Um, there's a lot of interest and discussion in vaccines and what's coming. Um, um, so we're going to hit on that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of what we should keep doing um, as far as our mitigation, our public health measures, and then how we can start to think about making plans for, um, for the holidays and, and for the next few months of our lives um, and, and what those, how those plans might look different from previous years or in some ways the same, um, but how we can still look for finding kind of importance and meaning and, set and value in those. Um, and then I wanted to end just kind of with a mental health check-in since we talked so much last time about mental health and just see how you guys are doing and if there are additional resources that our behavioral health subcommittee could help work on for you or your spouses um, or loved ones and, um, and maybe remind ourselves of some of those healthy coping mechanisms we talked about last time. If you weren't on that call, we'll, um, the content won't, like, won't have been necessary to continue that conversation, but um, I appreciate it. So this map is straight from the the Texas Department of State Health Services COVID-19 dashboard. Um, it is uh, 
data from yes, well, as of the 12th, right, but it's what was posted um, yesterday. And what you see is what most of us know because we lived it is that we, when, when this pandemic started in um, March, um, we had very few cases, and then over the summer, we had a real explosion in cases. Um, I'm going to encourage. Uh, we're getting some feedback from somebody, so if, if you're not on mute, if you don't mind muting, that would be awesome. Um, but we are going to, so we had that spike in July. There was a lot of discussion in July about the concern for hospital capacity. There was, you know, national news was made because there was concern that Houston in particular might be reaching capacity and looking at alternate venues. Um, and then in, in mid-July, the governor's... Um, mandate to wear masks or kind of early to mid-July uh, came into effect. Um, and what you see is that when we started implementing better public health measures across the state more consistently, we saw cases decrease, um, which is great. Um, we hit in September kind of a low. And then what you'll see over the last month or so is a steady and in some, maybe a slight increase up, right? Um, it's a little tricky because uh, you look at some of those one day spikes um, and DSHS will get a, a dump of data from a particular lab at, at a time. Um, and so I think that yellow line, that seven day rolling average is much um, more helpful to look at um, when we're looking at kind of where we are as far as cases around the state. Um, when we talk about capacity and strain on our healthcare system, I think hospitalization rates are really helpful to follow. Um, and so you see a similar trend there with hospitalization rates in Texas as far as that peak in July um, and then a decrease. What you will see though is that we still like persistently have not gotten back down to those levels where we were at in let's say April or May um, where we had um, less than a thousand people um, in um, in the hospital um, around 1500 for most of those months. Um, right now, there's about 4,000 patients with COVID in hospitals. Um, we, this One of the things that DSHS does that I think is really helpful is gives us what kind of our capacity is. Um, and so we do have ICU beds and hospital beds available across the state. What this doesn't tell us is what's happening in a particular community. Um, and so right now, I, from what I know, I don't know of any particular areas that are in, in um, kind of the orange zone of, of being at risk of running out of ICU or hospital beds. But that certainly, again, is where Houston was earlier this summer and, and is something that, that could happen again with particular communities. And so knowing what's happening in your own community is really helpful. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's some good news in that we are certainly not where we were a few months ago when things were at their worst. Um, there's also some, um, discouraging maybe news that we haven't been able to fully get those numbers back down to where they were or really kind of continue that tail that really looks like we've plateaued, if not maybe even seeing a little bit of increased activity here these last couple of weeks. Um, and there's a variety of reasons that that may be happening. Um, one of which is that um, people are tired, y'all. I mean, we're all tired, right? Um, but I think uh, people are getting um, tired and, and many people are getting kind of complacent with some of the um, measures, some of those infection control measures that, that we'll talk about. Um, also, we did send a whole lot of kids across the state to school, back to school. And so we have this a time now where we have people having larger activities together and where higher numbers of people are together. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so I did just want to give you guys a little bit of an overview of the school reopening work group and kind of what we're doing. Um, so it is made up um, of 20 pediatric infectious disease and public health experts from across Texas. We have three local health authorities represented, which is really excellent because they're the ones who are making on the ground decisions for their communities. And so that's been incredibly helpful for us. Um, and, um, and I sometimes joke it's like herding cats because Many of these people are honestly far more qualified as far as expertise um, in particular areas um, to, um, to provide guidance, but, um, but hopefully I can help uh, steer the ship um, as, we, as we help schools learn how to, how to reopen as safely as possible. And at the outset of our, gr of our group's formation back in July, we, we determined that we really had two key focuses. One was to support physicians who are caring for school-aged children. So what information do pediatricians like me and other physicians across the state, whether they're family practice docs or ER or 
or urgent care, you know, um, who are seeing taking care of children as they're returning to school, what do they need to know about when, when to test kids, when to safely return, kids can return to school, um, when to, what, what to do with student athletes, different issues like that. Um, and then we wanted to also provide guidance and technical assistance to state agencies and to schools about how to most safely return to face-to-face -face education um, and considerations that they need to have needed to have in process. So that's included guidance to UIL as well as the Texas Education Agency. We've done a lot of that work in collaboration with the Texas Pediatric Society, um, which has been a really wonderful thing. Obviously from my bio, I'm pretty intimately involved with both organizations, um, but it's been a really great way to utilize the expertise of both of both organizations, I think, in that process. I will also give a shout out if any of you guys ever run across TMA staff, Anna Stelter and Meredith Venice have our, our staff for this work group and they have put in countless hours of, trem of tremendous work um, on this work, on, on this process and, and I'm so appreciative for them. Um, so just to give you an idea of what we've done so far, I will actually um, share this with Pam so that she can send it out because all of these are live links. I didn't really think about that. It doesn't work so well in a Zoom <laughs> slideshow. Um, but what we've done is we created some, some guidance around for those first couple things that schools, like what a school infection control plan should look like and how physicians can engage their schools and communities on return to school issues. Then we developed a decision tree for school nurses so that they know, uh, some, have some guidance on who to send home, who, when they can come back to school, those sorts of things. Um, created some educational materials for physicians to use in their offices on pediatric symptoms related to COVID because they're not identical to adults. And particularly there's this phenomenon um, that is rare but very severe among some children called MISC, which is multiple inflammatory system system in children. Um, and MISC uh, is something that, that can happen to children after they've had COVID, usually four to six weeks later, and they'll get a really robust immune response with high fevers, low blood pressure, looks um, a lot like what we could, would consider to be sepsis or sometimes overwhelming infection, although they're not actively infected at the time. Um, and so, and that um, has some cardiac risks associated with it too. So it has kind of some really particular guidelines to help um, people caring for kids. Um, one of the things that a lot of people hadn't thought about, but in schools and pediatric offices all across the country, we routinely during the fall and winter give nebulizer treatments to, to young children and those are aerosolizing procedures. And so we developed some guidance for both physician offices and for schools in how to transition kids away from those as much as possible and then how to make them as safe as possible if they needed to do them created a return to school letter so that when I see a kid in clinic, you know, mostly I did this work because I needed help in my own practice, right? Um, so that we could, when I when we see a kid at work, we have a really simple form that tells the school when it's safe for that child to come back, whether they've tested positive, whether they've been exposed and need to isolate for 14 days, or whether we've identified something else that's the source of their symptoms and it's safe for them to return sooner. Um, mask exemptions have been a huge issue for um, for schools, and so creating a uh, we created a mask exemption letter and um, and form that really actually outlines how few exemptions there are to wearing masks that really the vast majority of children and adults should be wearing masks even those with um, heart conditions and pulmonary conditions in fact um, you can make the argument that um, those are people uh, people with those underlying conditions um, need to wear the masks even more um, so these, uh, this information is all on the TMA resource page. Um, if you have a particular piece you're interested in or want to look a little bit more deeply and then I'll have, I'll have Pam share the links too when we're, when we're done. Um, so we've, we've started sending kids back to school. What's happened, right? Um, I think is um, something that everybody was really curious to see. Um, so the Department of State Health Services and the TA are working together to collect data from school districts about what we're seeing in schools. I do want to give a few caveats. This data is super incomplete. Um, it's better than it was, but like the first week, we only had about 40% of school districts report data. So that tells you that there's a lot that we're, we're we're missing. Um, and then one of the things that's been kind of a challenge is that this number of 
estimated students was calculated the first week of school, um, but many, many districts started virtually and then have transitioned to face-to-face, -to -face, so it doesn't give us a great picture of how many kids are actually like on campus now um, in schools across Texas. This data also only pertains to public schools, so they are not collecting private school data um, in this regard. So I think those are kind of important caveats. What you'll see though, I think, are there a couple of trends that are that we can speak to and that are not notable. The first one is that as more children have gone back to face and to face, we have seen more cases in schools. That makes kind of perfect sense, right? That's what you would expect to see. Um, I do think that when you look at it, um, given the number of children, what we are seeing is that while we are seeing isolated cases in schools, there have not been a huge number of large clusters where we've had school-based transmission. That has occurred in a few instances, um, certainly, but that um, schools that are following, you know, safety guidelines and measures really are um, identifying kids, sending them home, um, sending kids home to quarantine, and then we are, um, have a you know, not seeing a lot of spread within schools. Um, the other thing that I think is important to look at is that when you look at what we're seeing, even though there's a tremendously higher number of students, again, that that number that you see, that one million number is, I don't think something we can count on because that was just that first week of, of school. Um, and, and we've had many more students return to school now. But you are seeing um, percentage-wise a higher number of cases among staff. And that makes sense in that we know that young children are less likely to contract and spread COVID than older children and like teenagers and adults. Um, I will say in one of the districts here locally, um, the, they have had a staff, they've not had a student cluster, but they've had a staff cluster um, that appears to have occurred um, in the teacher's lounge, right? Um, so as those staff spend time together. We've had uh, heard anecdotal reports of a couple of school districts who are having challenges with staffing as far as having enough um, teachers available on campus to teach the kids who are there. Um, the other place that we have seen some spread in schools, um, kind of anecdotally, is school sports. And there's been, you know, we live in Texas, so people love their high school football. Um, I love high school football. Um, but uh, there are definitely some considerations um, because it is difficult to socially distance in a lot of sports, right? Um, and so if those of you all, if you have kids in your family or are thinking about sports, and this pertains to high school, but also junior high and college level sports and even recreational sports. So even thinking about things like church softball leagues and things like that as we move forward. I think when we want to think about it, we want to think about player safety and then spectator safety. Um, and player safety, I think we want to really consider that all sports are not equal. So I will use the my personal example. I have an 18 year old daughter who runs cross country. She wears her mask at the meet or her gator actually she usually wears a mask but for, for me she wears a gator because even when they line up they're running smaller cohorts right so only three schools can run at a time instead of sometimes there were 15 schools running at a time and they're just collecting times and then accumulating them at the end of a meet for the most part um, so they get, are able to spread out at the start as soon as the start goes and they start running she can pull her or down once she's kind of spaced. Um, that is a radically different experience than a kid who is playing contact football where they've got mouth guards, they're spitting out in between plays um, and taking out and holding and then putting back in or right uh, managing or basketball players where they're having a lot of contact. So thinking about the fact that not all sports are, are kind of equivalent as far as their risk goes um, is important just in understanding what that risk is. The other thing that's been a, a big issue recently that I think it's important for people to know about as parents and grandparents and um, is that um, there is uh, an there's evidence that adults and some children after COVID-19 infection will develop myocarditis, which is an inflammation of their heart. Um, and that that can be particularly dangerous among athletes because as they participate in an athletic activity and, and their heart rate goes up, it can, it can trigger an arrhythmia that can, that can um, in certain instances be fatal, um, right? So it, it, they develop an irregular heart rhythm that, that 
um, that causes them to often faint, collapse, and sometimes even potentially have a death. And so there's been a lot of discussion about how we send kids back if they're athletes after they've had a COVID-19 infection. And the current recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Cardiology is that every student athlete who has had an infection, COVID-19 infection, even if they were asymptomatic, should be cleared by a physician before they return, and they should follow a gradual return to play protocol. So it means we don't go back and then play that day in a football game. We go back and do a couple of days of light aerobic activity and then increase that activity, move on to sports specific drills. Um, and typically it's a six step progression until they get all the way to playing. It's a similar progression, although not identical to the concussion progression that was started a few years ago, some of you guys may be familiar with, um, after we had a really significant number of of, stu of student athletes across the state develop concussions and some some long-term repercussions from those and then you know none of us are student athletes right so but we often know students and maybe those people who are thinking about being spectators i will say it's kind of killed me a little bit to not be able to go to any of my daughter's cross-country meets yet this, yet this year um, but i think there are some things we should consider as we're thinking about those spectator considerations. And these are really things that we can consider for any large public gathering as we're moving forward. Um, the first one is, does it, does it need to be in person? So one of the good things that's happened in all of this is that many, many high school football games are being televised now, which was not an option before. Um, and so they're able to put them up on um, internet platforms, on YouTube, um, Facebook Live, or even through local TV stations. Um, and so, um, sometimes we can watch and we don't have to be there. Um, there is going to be increased risk for seeing, for watching a sport that's being uh, held indoors than outdoors, um, especially if outdoors can include social distancing and masking. Um, that is currently the UIL requirement is that um, for schools, they have to have limited capacity. 50% um, is the UIL masks, but I, many school districts are making different choices because of the way their stadiums or their stands. Anybody in spectator. Um, so, oh, can you guys hear me? I got a message that my internet connection is unstable. Are we doing okay? Okay. Sorry. So the last two, probably three sentences before this. Okay. So sorry. Um, you know, you gotta, yeah, you gotta love this. Um, and I'm like right next to the router. I don't know what else to do there. Um, but um, just think about being making sure that uh, if you're going to participate in an activity like that, that it's someplace where you can be spaced and that you are wearing a mask. Um, so let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 testing. There was a big, a bunch of hubbub a month or six weeks or so ago because Abbott came out and said, we have a five minute rapid test that's five bucks, um, which is amazing. The federal government then quickly bought up um, a three month supply of them. So nobody's actually seen them in practice yet, um, at least in clinic settings. But I do want just to understand the differences. So PCR testing is considered the gold, the gold standard of testing. It um, is the most sensitive and specific test that we have. So it yields the, the fewest false negatives and false positives um, and is the, the challenge to it is that it does take time to get those results back. Many labs are now returning PCR tests within 24 to 48 hours, but there were times earlier this summer, especially at that peak in July and August, where we were at some, some labs, it was 10 to 11 days before you would get a test back. Um, and that makes it really hard to actually make a clinical decision or help somebody know whether, you know, they can return to work or, or what's going on with them. Um, the antigen tests are very sensitive, which basically means if you get a positive, you consider a person infected, but they can have more false negatives than the PCRs. Um, and so a lot of places have gone to doing what's kind of called default antigen testing. That means they'll do the antigen test first. If it's positive, they're like, yes, you have COVID. You need to, here's the instructions. Here's, you know, here's your medical guidance and you need to go home and isolate for 10 days. 
from the time of your of the onset of your symptoms right but if it's negative you might need a second test you might need that pcr to confirm if you're symptomatic um, because we might have gotten a false negative on that antigen test um, those tests are really nice though because they're usually available very quickly 15 minutes to an hour depending on how quickly the lab is running them or how many they have and then there are antibody tests that are available and i just want to be really clear that antibody tests only indicate past infection and it can't be used for diagnosis so you can't tell if somebody's antibodies are positive whether they currently are infected or infectious with COVID, and it doesn't determine immunity necessarily. So you may have antibodies on board, that doesn't mean necessarily that you can't get COVID um, again, uh, especially um, many antibody tests just test for their presence and not how many of those antibodies are present. We have seen documented cases over the last couple of weeks of the first known reinfections in the United States. Um, it's very few in number, so it's hard to draw a lot of conclusions, but of those that we have reported, they have been people who had relatively mild cases the first time around, so maybe they didn't create a huge immune response the first time around, but have been sicker the second time around. Um, well, that is something I think we will understand far greater by the end of this year. Um, is what, what really we're looking at um, as far as immunity goes. And the way we all would hope we could gain immunity is not by getting COVID, um, but by having a vaccine. So I did just wanna highlight kind of where we are with vaccines and vaccine candidates because um, this is on the news um, almost every day and it is a piece that's, that has had some politicization around it in such a way that I think those of us who are in public health really want to encourage and inform um, to, to look at the science, right? And, and to listen to our public health leaders around it. Um, so there are, there are four vaccine candidates that are in what are called phase three trials here in the United States. There are another set of candidates that are being phase three trialed in other countries, including um, several out of China. Um, just so that this list is not exhaustive worldwide. Um, but And some of these are also being tested in other countries. For example, the AstraZeneca test was actually developed at the University of Oxford and is being tested in the UK as well. Phase three means that they've done very small tests in phase one, or phase one tests are really animal tests. Phase two tests are your first human tests that look at do we get um, in a small number of people any significant adverse like events and do we get um, any antibody response? Are we seeing any, any improvement in antibodies? Um, and so these are the ones that have all moved to phase three, which broadens the number and the types of people who are being tested. Um, so Johnson & Johnson, I will say, was on this and then yesterday they paused their trial because they had some adverse outcomes in uh, patients and that doesn't mean they're necessarily related to the vaccine, but it means they're gonna pause giving any new vaccines until they get an answer there. Um, so that one may have a, a little bit more delay. The Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine both have said that they anticipate applying for an emergency use authorization from the FDA in late November, um, which uh, are the, the earliest to appear on track. Um, and then that AstraZeneca uh, Zeneca Oxford one is also in phase three. When you look at those different types of vaccines, so mRNA vaccines and live virus vaccines tend to produce the most robust antibody response. There are some killed virus vaccines that are being developed, but those, which is typical to the flu vaccine that you get as far as the, the type of vaccine it is, um, but those are tending not to cause as much strong of an immune response. And so there's concern that they just may not be as effective. Um, one of the challenges when we have a vaccine available is it's not like, okay, let's say that the EUA comes across in early December for the Pfizer vaccine and they're like, yay, you're approved, go for it. So that doesn't mean that everyone can run out and go get a vaccine the next day, right? Um, there's a huge concern about distribution and volume and how we go from from manufacturing, like scale up manufacturing, um, and the federal government is investing money in that, and then how we distribute to people. One of the particular concerns is that several of these vaccines have to be kept at super, what are called super cold temperatures, so like less than 40 degrees, less than negative 40 degrees. Um, I can tell you as a pediatrician, I do not have anything in my office that can store something at, at negative 40 degrees, right? I've got a freezer for, for my, my um, vaccines that have to be at, um, 
you know, less than 32 and I've got a fridge that maintains the others. Um, but that piece of like, it's not just the vaccines, it's getting the vaccines at that temperature to places that can store them at that temperature and then can give them to the right people. So there's gonna be a lot of logistics. DSHS and the governor's task force is working on that already for the state of Texas. Um, and then do know that when we do have a vaccine available, whichever of these vaccines it is, that it is pretty wide consensus among the medical community that we will be, we will be vaccinating our high risk populations first. So that will include, there will probably be an age limit, um, that will include healthcare workers, um, that will include likely some people with, um, with um, certain pre-existing conditions who may not fall in that in that age range. So for example, we know that diabetes is a particularly high risk condition. And so that may be um, one of the populations that's defined. Um, notice I did not mention kids at all. Um, kids will probably be kind of the last on the list for vaccination um, because they tend to not get as sick and have as high hospital hospitalization and death rates. Um, so I say all of that to say that I think it's it's realistic that even when a vaccine is available to the public, it will still be several months before we really are at a place where we've had even probably up to six to nine months before we are at a place where we have vaccinated a significant amount enough of the population to consider that we've moved to that kind of herd immunity piece. Um, so a vaccine being approved does not mean we stop doing all the other things, right? So what are those other things that prevention is still primary? I know you guys know this, but I just can't ever give a talk about COVID and not, not remind people. Um, masking, we, we watched that graph earlier where we saw a significant decrease when we had universal masking implemented. I will tell you, I, you know, I'm in kind of um, smaller city, East Texas. I, the last couple of weeks, as I go to Brookshire's and Target, um, to get my groceries and really um, disappointed in the number of people I see out in public without masks on anymore. It's like, ah, I mean, the, that order's still in place, but nobody's doing anything about it. So we're just gonna do whatever, whatever we want to. Um, we know that that's really important because of the number of people who may have COVID and either be asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic. And so maybe shedding and spreading, but not really aware that they're sick. Social distancing, keeping that six feet, hand hygiene, washing your hands. And then this one, I think, especially as we've, we're sending kids back to school, staying home if you're not well. If you have any of the symptoms that are consistent with COVID, you know, cough, runny nose, fever, sore throat, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, fatigue, loss of smell or taste, you don't, like, don't go home, call your medical provider, figure out if you need to get tested or how long you need to stay home um, to ensure that you're not infectious. Even if you think, yeah, this is probably just allergies, right? Um, because um, we've had a lot of people who thought they just had allergies, who it turns out had COVID. So I think we are all trying to figure out what we do now, right? Like, how do we make decisions about what to ha happen over, especially over the next holidays? Um, and I certainly am not going to tell anyone what to do or not to do with their own family. I think my hope would be to give you guys some framework of things to consider as you're making choices. Um, so the first piece to consider is your own personal risk and the risk of people who you might be seeing. Um, so I, for example, my personal risk from a health standpoint is not terribly high at given my age and my health conditions, but my personal risk of potentially being infected is relatively high because I go to work and at least two days a week I'm seeing sick kids in clinic, right? Um, I'm wearing my mask and, and, um, and eye protection and all of those things, but the, my risk for potentially having encountered the virus recently is pretty high. Um, and then the risks of those you might be seeing, uh, when I think about the big family, th Thanksgiving is my, you know, my mom's extended family gets together and it's often 45 people, right? It's a, it's a good group and we love each other and, and enjoy each other even, um, even as we think and, um, and live different lives, right? Um, but among that group, um, more than half of them are over the age of 65. Um, typically as we get together and so um, or at least half and so thinking about their risk being different I've got a couple of aunts who are on medications that affect their immune system their risk are going to be going to be different and so really determining or understanding the risks of both your own risk and the risk of the people you might be seeing that's flip side of the risk of people you might be seeing also has their 
their potential risk of like, have they been kind of isolating themselves or living in a, a smaller bubble or have they been out with large groups of people going to large gatherings and doing things like that that might put them at more risk to be sick and not know it. Um, and then we think about traveling. Um, and I think we do need to think about how we travel. So in general, you would think a car would be safer um, as long as you are careful about kind of where you stop and making sure you're masked if you stop there. Um, I will say that not air, every airline is equal right now as far as the, the strategies that they're implementing. And so if you feel the need to fly, if you have distance to travel that's that far, you really need to look at which airlines are still keeping middle seats open, which airlines are requiring universal masking at all times um, for all ages other than those typically under two um, those types of um, those types of things so that you know you know you're making the mess the best decision possible if you are considering flying I would also really encourage if you have any flexibility in your schedule that you consider off-peak travel times you know we traditionally while well, flights in general are, are less full right now um, than they traditionally have been, and we're all hearing about how that's affecting the economy of the airline industry. It also, I think, is important to remember that that, um, like the day before Thanksgiving and then that Sunday after Thanksgiving are often two of the busiest flying days of the year. So if, if you have a way to travel on different days than that, that would also potentially, you know, reduce your risk of the number of people you're going to come into contact with. Um, and then thinking about what activities you're doing. So I mentioned that Thanksgiving that we typically have, that, that is not a great idea for my family this year, right? Given, given where we are and the risks. Um, does that mean that I don't see anybody? That maybe my, my parents come and, and we spend the weekends together with you know, my parents and just me and my kids? That might be a reasonable reasonable choice. Um, this probably isn't the year to do the big giant family gatherings. It doesn't mean we have to be in isolation all the time necessarily though. And then um, we are lucky we live in Texas where freak, now I say this, I also remember Thanksgiving days where the Cowboys were playing and it was snowing. Um, so take that, but we also have Thanksgiving days a lot of the times where it's 875 degrees outside in a huge swath of the state. Um, and so thinking about, um, things that can be done outside um, if we are going to get together um, because that will will reduce our risk. Um, and then the biggest thing I think I would remind people is we have to have to have to be flexible this year. Any plans that you are making, you have to be willing to cancel or financially be able to cancel if anyone is feeling ill um, because they should not participate. Um, and we want Aunt Bertha to be around for you. I don't actually have any Aunt Bertha, y'all, but um, Aunt Pat, I've got three of those, um, <laughs> actually. Um, so if we want Aunt Pat to be around for years and years and years to come, then if we're ill, we cannot go spend Thanksgiving with her this year, um, even if we don't know if it's COVID or not, right? Um, that that really is the thing we can do to protect people the most. And then I wanted to stop and let us have a little bit of a conversation. I'm happy to answer questions about any of the topics we've covered so far, but I also just wanted to check in because um, we are now what, seven months in to this experience and people are getting tired. I mean, it, it was scary and it's, and it's still, there is still a lot of fear, but I think weariness is kind of taking over um, from fear. Um, and exhaustion and even frustration for many people. Um, and so I wanted to get a chance to hear from you guys either verbally or in the chat, like what's going well? Are there some things that have been able to kind of come back into life that are going well or that you've been able to adapt? Um, I will give um, an example. My So my 18 year old is the um, student council president for her school this year. And I have watched this group of kids take their slate of ideas for 2020 that included like going weekly to read with students in the elementary schools and big community-wide events like a trick-or-treat trail and adapt them in ways that that I didn't even think about. So they now actually have a virtual online library where the kids have, like these high school students have read children's books and, you know, and you know, with the, the words at the bottom of the page and the kindergartners and first graders can go and click on those YouTube videos and listen to those stories being read to them and read along with them, um, which is amazing, right? Um, and so watching some of the adaptability and ingenuity in particularly my, my senior has been really, really um, phenomenal. 
Um, but I also think it's important for us to recognize that there are some particular groups of people who are really struggling and who's struggling and A, are there ways that we can help support them, but, but B, also I, I'd like to take um, this and hear from you guys because our behavioral health subcommittee and our our COVID task force are looking for additional ways that we can help support the mental health of, of Texans in general, but specifically of our members and our members' families. Um, and so if you all have thoughts about what you need, what would be helpful, um, I'd really like to hear those. Um, I'm gonna exit my slides so that I can see you guys. I think I see Agnes raising her hand. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, for being with us today. Um, could you tell us how the treatments for those in the hospital have changed where there's more recovery than death? You know, what are you seeing that's changed dramatically? Yeah, so, and I will say I am not a hospital-based physician, so this is not my area of expertise, but obviously being on the task force, I'm hearing about those things. Um, and and uh, despite what we may hear that there's like a cure um, out there, a lot of what is happening related to improved outcomes is that we have become better at the supportive care. So not that there's a magic drug. There are several things that are being tried. And certainly, like, we've got good evidence around using high dose steroids, um, which have also been in the news a lot lately, but, and that that can be particularly helpful. And there's an evidence base there. We're still collecting evidence on those antibodies and some of the other antibiotics that have been used as, as really anti-inflammatories in this process. But that supportive care, that how we position patients, how early we initiate those steroids, right? Those types of things have, have significantly increased our survival rates um, among hospitaliz hospitalized patients. Um, I don't know if that answers specifically enough for you, Agnes, or not. Yeah, well, well, I had a former neighbor who, you know, had kidney failure and unfortunately went on to die and mm -hmm. from Maryland. And um, are, you, are they still seeing that? that there, you know, a lot of these patients, I mean, he was a, a senior, um, that are getting these kind of conditions with so, organ shutdown. So um, you, we certainly can see that. And there's a couple of ways that COVID can cause kid kidney damage. One of which is it causes an inflama inflammation in our lungs, but not our lungs, sorry, in our muscles. It causes inflammation everywhere. That's really the the bugger of COVID, right? Is that, that it can inflame literally any part of your body, your heart, your brain, your lungs. Um, but in that inflammation in the muscles, we, we get some muscle breakdown and that, that byproduct, it's called rhabdomyolysis is the, the fancy medical term for the process, but anyway, can cause kidney failure. Um, we also have seen some cases of kidney failure because one of the things we now know about COVID that we didn't understand well in March and April and maybe even May was that it, the, the condition makes you prone to developing blood clots. And so one of the uh, treatments that is initiated very early now when patients are hospitalized is putting them on, on anticoagulants or blood thinners. Um, and that has reduced many of those complications because um, yeah. some of that kidney failure was because they were blood clots actually going to the kidneys and causing, right, and, ca and causing renal failure for some people. And so yeah. that has been a really important piece of treatment for for people with COVID. He, he had it early on, so yeah. Yeah. it was just devastating. I'm, yeah, I'm very sorry to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I also, see. I don't know you, Harold Stone, but your um, your picture makes my heart happy. <laughs> he's, got, he's got Fred Sanford on his. <laughs> um, on his, his. a chat question from Terry Andrews. Mm -hmm. um, Terry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I read in one of the distribution articles, um, and I read way too many the, for the vaccine, that only physicians will be able to give the vaccine in the first round. And I'm the chairman of immunization collaboration in Tarrant County. So ah, yeah. I am wonder will the nurses be allowed to give the vaccine? Do you I need mind to ask I them. Dr. Smith, this is Dr. Hall. Oh, yes, no, please go for that, Cynthia. So we just had our vaccine distribution and meeting the initial one yesterday because we're starting to get prepared at the UTL Science Center. And I think that is a mistake on the DSHS website. So Dr. McGay, who's the public health authority of, of uh, county, um, asked for clarification. And, and those under the physician who would normally give those vaccines like nurses will be allowed to give the vaccine. 
there's a lot of ambiguity on those DSHS guidelines because they're starting out the process. So, you know, one of the things that, that I noted when we were looking at is the risk stratification. There's so much overlap that if you use that, almost everybody would get the vaccine except for children under 18. So just those are some things that we're going to have to be working on going forward. So just just okay. my opinions. Thanks. And that's I, probably where I read it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's still you know, okay. work in progress, I think. Okay, the, thank you. The way I read that, and, and Cynthia, Paul may have more insight there, is um, so there are times when we administer vaccines even without a physician order, and that it might require a physician order to start with, which would not mean that's that, I mean, you guys don't want me giving shots, right? You don't, so I'm pretty sure you don't want to be giving shots either. Shot. Yeah. Um, I learned how to do it 20 years ago, and that was the last time I did, right? Like, I'm, I haven't, in, in 15 years of clinical practice, I have not given a single shot because that is not my scope. I have somebody else in my clinic who does that work, right? Um, and so that is how I had, had read that, or what, that, what I thought that meant, but I'm happy to hear that they're getting clarification from, from DSHS. I do know that clinical sites are being asked to register um, as potential um, administration sites. Um, DSHS has sent that out to us in the past That's interesting 10 days or so. Because well, we talked about that and it really, really wasn't clear if every single entity had to register. So if, for example, if you're T Health Science Center Tyler and you've got five clinics, do they have to register? And the way I'm reading it, just because of what you talked about, the refrigeration and freezer recommendations, that may be one of the reasons I think every single site probably has to register. That's what we're thinking right now. Um, so have you gotten any verification on that? No, that is my understanding as well, um, or th th that, that it's individual physical location. But again, I, I don't, um, I, I think we're, we still have a lot to hear from. <laughs> um, yeah, it's what, what other people need to know is that your every in location has to be MTRAC registered. So every vaccine will be recorded and followed. So one of the things that is kind of a catch with this vaccine, with this, these particular vaccines that are being developed um, is that they're all, at least to this point, uh, at least two dose vaccines. So you get one and then after a specified period of time, you have to get a second one. And you have to get the same vaccine. So like if I got the Pfizer vaccine in December, I, if it's two months later or whatever, um, they're all different. So I don't want to, I don't don't take that to the bank on Pfizer, but if it's two months later or six months later, I have to get the Pfizer vaccine again. And so that you can imagine creates a whole set of issues for supply chain. It also is different in that many of our other vaccines like the childhood vaccines that I'm giving every day in my clinic, if I give a hepatitis B vaccine that's one brand and the patient, or let's say the hospital does when they see have the baby as a newborn and I see the baby in clinic, it doesn't matter which hepatitis B which brand of hepatitis B vaccine I give at two months and at six months, they're still fully immunized. And so that's part of the reason why the MTRAC piece is going to be so, so important for the COVID-19 vaccine in vaccines in particular is because we have to know who got what to make sure they get the appropriate second dose. It's going to be, I mean, it's going to be a real challenge. I, I don't, <laughs> um, um, for sure. Um, I do also truly believe that America is up to this. Like we, we can figure this out. We have people who logistically run stink at Amazon, right? Um, I think about the people who like how HEB changed their entire workflow and chain at the beginning of this pandemic to get food to people where they needed it, when they needed it in really remarkable ways. Like we have this you know, this ability, but it's, it's going to take a really collected effort of people with that supply chain expertise, people like um, Dr. Ludlow, I think about at our health science center, um, and then people with the healthcare on the ground application piece, like Dr. Ball. Um, Dr. Smith, we received yeah. a, um, a question in the chat. On the topic of returning to school, is there a discussion on surveillance testing? So, yes, interestingly, um, the governor actually came out yesterday and announced a pilot program with six schools um, or slash school districts across the state to provide um, antigen testing um, as well as PPE for school staff 
to administer that antigen testing. So that was a huge piece we had as a kind of a concern um, from TMA is that um, schools have had a real, school nurses have had a real challenge getting appropriate PPE. And then if we ask them to test, um, that's a high risk activity, right? We've got to protect them. Um, those school districts, I don't know all of them off the top of my head. I will say since there's several East Texas folks on the, um, on the call, um, Longview ISD and, um, uh, Grace Community School here in Tyler, where I am, we're both on that list. Um, that pilot is supposed to begin in the next few weeks. We have not, um, we've reached out to the governor's office to see if we could get some additional information about the actual kind of protocol and how they're planning on using those. Are they going to be screening, like your school nurse is going to be screening symptomatic kids um, who come to their office, or they're going to start screening asymptomatic kids widespread in a school or particular populations such as um, uh, like the football team or right um, that kind of thing we don't have any specific information there yet but that is like breaking news as of yesterday um, is that that we're starting to roll that piece out in the state schools are also being asked to register by the end of this month if any of y'all are working with schools or have connections to schools in your area as to whether uh, they are interested in participating in school-based testing moving forward so okay, so that was I'm glad I got on today. We're working with the CDC as part of an independent provider agreement. It's a pilot project where like about 47 members across the country are working with CDC on projects. What we're working on is actually on testing and using testing as a surveillance tool, actually serial testing, you know, two to three times a week with a less sensitive test to try to keep people out when they're most symptomatic from school. So if you have any information or ties to this project that you could like hook me up, um, I'd really learn more about what they're doing. Yeah, I will, as soon as we, so TMA staff, Meredith and Anna, my, my favorite people in the world these days, um, have sent a request to the governor's office. Um, as soon as we uh, get back information, I will be happy to share with you. That'd be great, thanks. Yeah. We have seen some instances of routine surveillance working well. Um, so a couple of examples, There's there are several universities across the country that implemented un, like multiple times a week screenings um, and that have been helpful and effective in helping them isolate students who were who uh, became positive and, and reducing that chain of outbreaks that happens. Um, and then probably the most notable one is looking at our professional sports and um, how we, at the beginning of baseball season, it very quickly people were like, oh, we might not have baseball season because within the first week we had two teams that had outbreaks. And then we actually are now getting close to playing a World Series. I'd really like the Astros to do better, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they actually funded a lot of the testing that was done on an, an antigen-based saliva testing product and share, have shared that um, across, you know, institutions and so have kind of really upped the game and, and brought us closer to maybe doing some more routine surveillance. Testing. Yeah. It's, it's really great. Yeah. The, the um, potential for more widespread availability and, and uh, cost-effective tests, I think, which the Abbott Now test is, um, will will be a, a game changer there. I do know, uh, Cynthia, in addition, I can connect with Don Murphy, who's on the task force, is that's one of his particular areas of like interest and expertise. He's an ID doc. Dr. Smith, I have a question. Has contract, I know that TMA's been involved in this, has contact track tracing, has gotten better with the helps of the physicians? Have you noticed that or have you heard any more about that? Because I know at first that was just a nightmare. So I, I don't know that I can speak to that statewide. Um, there are, um, are, I think, are some areas that are that it's working well in, and others that that still are really struggling. There's there's a lot of challenges with contract tracing. First, being getting timely um, information, the health department um, getting timely information from the labs and the physicians' offices that are ordering the tests, right? Because if if they don't get that data for a week, well your contact tracing kind of goes, is very difficult to go backwards. And then the biggest thing that I hear anecdotally from some of my friends who are doing some volunteer contact tracing for our health department is the challenge of getting people to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't, we have, we have kind of made a very conscious decision in this country and I understand this choice in, in the balance of like liberty and freedom pieces. It's, there's a real tension, but there are other countries where everyone has an app on their phone. Mm -hmm. And it contact traces them. And so then when somebody tests positive, they can literally pull the data and 
see all the people they were within those contact points. Like it's almost an automated system to, to identify those people. That is, that's not something that's happening here in the United States, which um, again, I understand the privacy balance of that, but it does also, it, um, it, it inhibits us from using technology the way it could most maximally be used for tech, for contact tracing potentially. So. Right. Well, I know they downloaded the app on everybody's phone at one point in time, uh, which I think freaked people out, but I haven't seen that they've actually used it. So that probably explains why. Is there any other questions real quick for Dr. Smith? Because I know she has a meeting to get to. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Good information. Um, you're awesome. And I hope you have a fabulous rest of your day and enjoy the, the conference you're fixing to attend. Thank Thanks you guys for all being on here. It. You guys I have a wonder wonderful. Sorry. I just want to remind everybody that next month we will have our webinar for, um, and it's going to be the TMA's VP of Legislation Affairs, Dan Finch. And he's going to be discussing the legislative session that's coming up in, in January 2021. It will have CME credit, so please let your, your physician spouses know as well. Um, and this way we can learn about TMA's top, uh, top tier issues and how we can help advocate for those issues. And um, there's a lot of exciting things going on. By then the elections will be behind us. If you have not done so, please go out and vote. Do not forget to do that. <laughs> Yay, I'm so proud of you. Did it this morning. <laughs> and um, so we really do appreciate it. If you guys have any other topics or speakers that you'd like us to consider for 2021, please send that information to Pam or Sasha. We are looking for good uh, speakers to help us out through this time. And, um, but we're, just a reminder, all of our members are invited to participate. It's open to everybody. So let everybody know um, is, that's in your local alliances that they are welcome to attend these meetings as well. Um, anything else, Pam? Just thank you, Dr. Smith. That was an amazing presentation once again. Very informative. I learned a lot of great stuff and helped clarify things that I've been hearing misinformation on. And uh, but it was really great. So thank you so much for your time. And I think everybody from the comments I'm seeing, everybody really loved your presentation. So thank you so much for joining us again today. Thanks for having me. You guys have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Thank you.